Last time I'm doing this today, I'm just doing an introduction. I'm not on this panel, but I want to introduce our sponsor who will be introducing this session. Um, I'm doing that because I've known Millie Hurt for a long time. I've known her since her days when she was a student at Cleveland State, where she picked up uh, her master's. She also has a degree from Kent State. She's worked for the Cuyahoga County Land Bank. She's worked for CHN. And she's been with the Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing for um, about uh, six years now, where she now serves as Vice President of, of Affordable Lending. And uh, she is, I think, one of the major reasons why we got the sponsorship and I wanted to thank her. And I'm gonna turn this over to Millie to make the introduction to the panel and I'm, I'm gonna be leaving. Thank you. Millie, you there? I am, can you hear me? Okay, great. Thank you, Jim. And yes, um, we are so proud to um, sponsor the Ohio Land Bank Conference. Uh, we realize, and like uh, Jim said, I actually have worked for the Cuyahoga County Land Bank, so kind of been in uh, your shoes, and I see Dennis and others um, on on here today. So um, welcome, and we are in the session, How Can Land Banks um, Lead on Home Rehabilitation? And I think this is so... Um, critical to the work that uh, certainly we're doing in um, the low-income housing tax credit world. Uh, Ohio Capital Corporation for Housing is over 30 years strong, um, 5 billion in uh, equity fundraised and uh, 50,000 units of affordable housing for families um, and seniors and those of special needs populations. So um, we are excited uh, to um, partner with you all and um, and to be on here and learning about uh, what creative uh, financing and other strategies you guys are working on um, in your line of work. So I will turn it over. I'm not exactly sure who is uh, going to be taking the lead on this, but I just wanted to say welcome and again, thank you for having us. Thank you very much, Millie. My name is Isaac Robb and I work with Jim at the Western Reserve Land Conservancy. We figured that after 10 straight hours of Jim moderating and hosting his essentially his talk show that we would give him a bit of a break. So I'm really glad that many of you are still with us on set. You made it to session 11. That's quite the feat. And as many of you know, um, Ohio isn't getting any younger as a state, both from a population standpoint or from our housing stock. And since 2010, Ohio has actually only added close to 80,000 housing units, which is about 2% of its total inventory. And that increase has been mostly in its suburban communities and not in its historic urban cores. In fact, there's been a decline of an almost equal percentage in housing units in our city centers. About half of Ohio's housing stock is also built before 1965 with a quarter built before 1940. And like anything, as times change, things evolve, uh, it's really important to make sure that mechanicals are updated and as taste and things change, that um, these different types of housing units are, are brought back into, into the fold. And obviously from a triple bottom line perspective, rehab is important to keep neighborhoods intact, to keep um, you know, demolition debris out of landfills, if at all possible as well as from a financial standpoint, often having cost savings from having to go new build. So today we're lucky to be joined by four experts in this field from very different um, backgrounds and perspectives. We'll have Dennis Roberts, who leads the real estate team with the Cuyahoga County Land Bank, discussing their deed and escrow program. We have Amanda Mayan from uh, Man Holdings who's joining us and she provides a really unique private sector perspective that has been really successful in doing rehabs in the city of Cleveland and Cuyahoga County. Then we have Tiffany Sokol from Youngstown Neighborhood Development Corporation. Her and her team has been successful doing it from a nonprofit side, and they'll talk about how they've scaled up their internal capacity to do all of the work. And then last but not least, we have Carrie Shea, who comes uh, to us from the Director of Special Initiatives from Home by Hand, but she's really leading the Neighborhood Homes Initiative Act, which as we all know, um, rehab, one of the difficult things about doing rehab in Ohio is the um, sort of funding gap where the, a lot of our markets aren't strong enough to support the cost of doing rehab. And she's gonna be talking about a really exciting thing from the federal level on how we maybe can, can begin to address that. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dennis Roberts.
Good afternoon. Slide. All right. First, uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to share with you some of the work that we are here at Cuyahoga County doing relative to housing. Um, I was asked to speak about deed and escrow primarily, but I want to take a step back and tell you a little bit uh, about our overall strategy because it will help you better understand how to design your deed and escrow program. Uh, basically, our disposition strategies fall into four main buckets. Um, first, in-house, which I'll discuss momentarily, deed and escrow, straight conveyance, and new construction. With regard to in-house, uh, what that is is a situation where if the land bank owns a particular house um, and we want to rehab it, we basically scope the house out, um, try to determine what it is that the house needs in order for it to be marketable. We hire a general contractor through a bidding process like you normally would. And then we look to rehab that house and sell the house. There's pros and cons about this particular program. Um, as you might expect, one of the pros is that you get the highest quality if you manage the job well and you hire a good contractor. However, one of the challenges is that, you know, it requires a staff intensive um, and it's costly, particularly in the markets in which we work because, you know, we're a public entity, you know, we have to put together a high quality product. Um, we have a brand we want to maintain and uh, sometimes the markets just won't sustain it without some type of subsidy, whether it's direct or indirect. So there's trade-offs. Secondly, deed and escrow, which I will get into in detail at the, uh, in the additional slides. However, it suffices to say that basically what it amounts to is that if you own your, entity, your organization owns a property and uh, you, you put that property on the market, a buyer comes forward and says, hey, I'm interested in buying this house. Um, what you do then is allow that buyer to rehab the house while you still own it. Once the house has been verified that it has been rehabbed, that house is then transferred to that buyer. Again, pros and cons to this particular program. One of the most significant um, benefits to the program is the leverage because you're not using um, land bank money. Um, the other aspect of it is uh, it's less staff intensive because the buyer in effect is doing most of the work. They're using their money. Um, they're actually executing the rehab itself, dealing with the uh, relative municipality relative to permits, et cetera. So there's pros and cons. There's risk um, as well. Many times buyers start these projects, they have no idea what they're in for. Um, projects can stall, they take longer than what they expect and you have challenges in regard to completion. A third approach that we use is something we call straight conveyance. Um, we think of it as we're working with our allies. I don't know about in your, how it works in your community, but here in Cleveland, there are a number of community development corporations or organizations that have been engaged in housing for a long time. They have experience. Uh, we work with them in a way where if we get a property, we then will convey properties to those organizations at our cost. Our, our agreement with those organizations is that we want them to ensure that the properties get fully rehabbed and get ultimately back on the tax duplicate. Again, one of the benefits to that particular program is that uh, we're able to help one of our allies, um, but more importantly, that ally has to have a mission that's um, um, consistent with our mission, which is basically getting that property rehabbed and back on the tax duplicate. Um, however, you know, one of the challenges, of course, is uh, you don't make any money doing that. And, uh, you know, a lot of your products, you can end up essentially giving away. And uh, in land bank, you have a lot of lost leaders. So how do you fund other parts of your operation if you're often giving your, your assets away. But again, these are just tools, depending on um, what you need at a given time, we, we use them and you can use them. And then finally, there's new construction. We've been engaged in new construction for the last couple of years. Um, it's very exciting, it's new. Um, I think it has certain advantages in terms of uh, strengthening and stimulating the market. However, um, it's costly. You know, uh, Many of these markets really won't support new construction without some type of subsidy. Um, but again, depending on your situation, whether you have a subsidy and what the overall approach is, new construction can be uh, appropriate in cer at certain times. Slide. Focusing primarily on deed and escrow. Again, as I described, uh, the deed and escrow program is 
basically you're using the house as leverage. Many people may be familiar with uh, certain municipal requirements wherein if you want to rehab a house in a given community, many municipalities will require you to put money into escrow. They essentially want to make sure you have the money to do the rehab. Well, in this case, I happen to believe it's better than putting the money in escrow because the challenge with that is that the buyer, in many cases, needs the money to do the rehab. So here we have the ultimate leverage. Um, we are basically holding the house while the house is being rehabbed. I mean, that's essentially the, uh, the critical part of the program. And we've found it's been very successful over the last 10 years or so. We've done over a thousand of these um, particular deed and escrow um, houses. Uh, one of the things we've learned, we learned early on, it's important to have a structured renovation plan. In other words, uh, we have uh, uh, project managers who basically develop uh, essentially a scope of work. Um, the reason you want to do that is because you want to be able to hold the buyer accountable for certain things. When we first opened, we didn't do that. We had the buyer develop a scope of work and it was an absolute fiasco because um, you know, you have certain expectations which may differ from the buyer. And then at the end of the process, uh, you may find yourself in conflict. The other thing I would suggest is having a, a timeline. You know, ours is 120 days. Buyers don't always stick to that timeline, but you want to create that expect, expectation right up front so you could try to push the buyer as much as you reasonably can. And then finally, periodic inspections. We learned this the hard way as well. We inspect our properties at least every 30 days. And we do all types of things to try to encourage the buyer to, to get done timely. Um, many of them are not timely. Some of them are. But at the same time, um, you know, you try to work with folks, but also encourage them to, to get the job done consistent with what they signed in the agreement. Um, I would suggest um, the, the, it is important to think through your technological needs. We use the property profile system. I know a number of land banks do as well. Um, it's a godsend for us because it allows us to really manage the deed and escrow properties with really, we're using about one and a half FTEs, which is pretty impressive with the amount of volume that we're, we're able to process. But we're able to do that is because of the technology. Um, you know, there's a spec sheet, there's a scope of work that our inspector goes out with. He, he or she goes to the home, checks it off, and then we store that information into the next uh, inspection period, which is in 30 days. And there's a whole system that we use in order to make sure that happens in a consistent, on a consistent basis. Um, next slide. One of the key considerations, if you are thinking about creating your own deed and escrow program that you need to make right up front is who is priority? Because if you're like our land bank, a lot of times you don't have properties that are necessarily valued, but every now and then you do. And when those, in those cases, everybody wants it. It could be Ms. Johnson, the owner occupier. It could be an investor. It could be a nonprofit organization or, or your CDC, community development organization. What we decided early on is that uh, from a policy standpoint, we want to create as many owner occupiers as we possibly can. What does that mean practically? What it means is that if we have a particular property for sale and we get offers from every group, investors, nonprofits, et cetera, we will take a lower offer from an owner occupier as compared to an investor. That's a policy decision that we made. But I think it's worth having that conversation early on. Otherwise, it leads to conflicts and a lack of clarity uh, when you interact with the public about um, the houses. Just so just as a tip, I recommend that you make a decision in regard to priority early. Slide. Another important mechanic that we use is if you apply to the deed and escrow program, we do what I call a public records real estate background check. We're not doing a criminal background check. We are doing a public records, real estate related background check. What are we looking for? The primary thing we're looking for is to make sure that the buyer does not currently own property that is tax delinquent for obvious reasons. Um, secondly, we look for buyers that don't have a foreclosure in their past uh, within the last three years. Things happen. That was a policy decision that we made years ago. Condemnations, again, what we're trying to flush out is are we dealing with a, a what we call a bad actor. You know, none of these, well, most of these things are not dispositive on, on its face. For example, uh, Secretary of State, different entities, just because you have a different entity, that doesn't mean you're uh, irresponsible uh, 
you know, you're engaged in irresponsible, irresponsible real estate behavior. It just means that um, we want to take a closer look. In fact, you might be a, a smart lawyer who's uh, positioned themselves in the, best way, in the best way they can to resist lawsuits and you're acting very responsibly. But, you know, these are the types of things that we look at up front to make a decision as to whether you are eligible to be a part of the deed and escrow program. Again, that's a policy decision that you need to make. Slide. So what is the basic process? Again, what we require upfront after we do that public records uh, check, uh, we require that the deed and escrow buyer put the money upfront. Um, one of the reasons that um, we do it up front is because, you know, once people get into these rehabs, a lot of times they have no idea uh, what's involved. And if you don't get the money up front, you may not get it later. Plus, we use it as leverage if they start falling behind or they don't want to close because we have the money and we have the house. And that's a certain amount of pressure that we can apply in a way to encourage them to successfully complete the rehab when that time comes. Again, I would recommend highly to inspect the property on a regular basis. You don't necessarily need to do it the way we do it every 30 days, but you need to have a system and someone responsible for that. What we've done um, early on, because we didn't have the staff, is we hired 1099 inspectors. So you're able to ebb and flow with those inspectors. You can calibrate the, based upon your money, based upon your inventory. Uh, but the key thing is you need to have someone responsible for periodic inspections. I'd recommend also making sure the jobs start timely just because a buyer signs a contract and says he's going to start work. You better go check <laughs> to see if they actually started work because if they start off poorly, in many cases, they end poorly. And then finally, what we do, we insist that all deed and escrow buyers obtain open and obtain permits as required by the particular municipality and actually um, obtain certificate of occupancy or something similar. Um, our thought process behind that is we want to make sure that the property is safe as much as one can do it and make sure they're compliant with the particular municipality in which the house is located. Um, and we do that for several reasons. So overall, you know, the deed and escrow program is a highly leveraged program in, in terms of time, meaning you can do a lot with a little time and it's highly leveraged with regard to money because really what you're doing is you're using private sector money to we have a house that you own or at least you have some ownership interest in. So um, I'll be available for questions at the, at the end of uh, the presentations and uh, thank you for giving me an opportunity to present. Thank you so much, Dennis. And actually, we do have our first question in the Q&A box. If you want to type in the answer, we can get to it at the end. Well, we can go from there. But up next, we have Amanda. Amanda, you're muted. OK, here we go. Good afternoon. I'm Amanda Mayan. I'm the CEO of Man Holdings. We are owner operators of commercial and multifamily residential uh, buildings with a specialty in the rehabilitation of multifamily apartment buildings. Uh, through our commercial work in the city of Cleveland, we realized that there was a community need to rehabilitate single family homes in some of these distressed areas. And so we got involved with community partners, including the land bank, uh, to begin rehabilitations that would contribute to our community. Um, so I'm going to talk about what the deed and escrow program looks like and feels like from a developer's perspective today. The first thing you want to do as a developer is identify the property that you may be needing to uh, engage in a rehabilitation for. Some of the sources that we use uh, for potential properties are looking at the lab land bank website or inventory list. I think it's super important for any land bank to have an inventory list that's very publicly accessible because it really ensures an egalitarian approach to who is able to access uh, any of these properties at any point in time. Uh, we will also canvas areas of interest for distressed properties uh, and suggest to the land bank if there's a property that seems like it might be getting ready to go under foreclosure uh, that we might have an interest. Uh, we'll look at the state forfeiture list and we'll also look at the tax delinquent property list. So now I've identified a property, what's next? Uh, 
first thing that I do is contact the land bank to receive their inspection report, as Dennis was talking about. Um, that everybody is on the same page is crucial for success. Uh, we'll walk the property with the land bank uh, representative, looking at their report together, make sure that we're all on the same page, uh, come to an understanding with the land bank representative regarding any improvements that might be required for transfer. Finally, we'll sign an amended report if there were amendments to it, which is not always, but does sometimes happen, uh, with the land bank representative and request a contract from the land bank. Okay. We agree on a purchase price and a timeline for renovation. As a developer, some of the risks that I watch for and perhaps uh, some of the things that any other land banks would, would want to watch for are being extra conservative, as Dennis spoke on the timelines, uh, when drafting your timeline. Uh, if you think an aspect of your project scope will take two months, it could take four. Sometimes those things just aren't in your control. So make sure that this planned timeline allots sufficient time for issues like city permitting delays. We've experienced a lot of those recently during COVID um, for things like getting meters placed. Uh, sometimes if a gas line has to be dug, that can be particularly challenging in the winter time. Uh, if you need to do a roof and you're in the middle of winter, you may need to wait until spring. So having eyes wide open towards some of those timing challenges is very important. Um, another challenge, as I mentioned before, with utilities, if a property was disconnected from gas or another utility for a couple of years, uh, it might be timely to get service lines dug and meters placed. Uh, estimated reads during the transfer of ownership. This is one that, that particularly can, can touch uh, investors and, and land banks as well uh, during a transfer process. Uh, if your city allows estimated reads for your utility companies, it's very important to take photographs on the day of transfer of your utilities so there is an actual timestamp and estimated reads are, are made sure to be accurate. Once you're getting ready to sign a contract, make sure you understand your contract with the land bank. If you don't, get advice from an attorney. Uh, one of the things that I love about working with CCLRC here in Cuyahoga County is that their land their contracts are very simple and straightforward. Uh, there's no need to make it complex. It just has to lay out all the information clearly for everybody. Uh, send your contract to a trusted title company. Um, we always get a title search. We request a title survey. Again, you don't want to find any surprises later on. And while you're not required to order title insurance, uh, we've found that ordering title insurance uh, is a benefit to us because it helps us later to remarket the property. Um, most of the houses that we rehab are not added to a portfolio that we're managing. Our goal with these houses is to get them back into the hands of owner occupiers within the community. We think that the private sector investors can be a very powerful tool uh, to rapidly get these houses back to end users and, and keep owner occupants in our communities, which keeps the communities ultimately stronger. Once the contract has been signed, uh, the land bank will countersign a contract and you deposit your purchase money in escrow with um, your escrow and closing agent. Uh, at that point, you'll receive permission to start work on your, your home. Uh, we recommend, like I said, taking pictures of all meters on the day that you take possession of deed and escrow. It's just a good timestamp for any utilities you may use going forward. Uh, rehab the house according to your inspection report and city code. As Dennis said, it's super important to do everything by the book. Uh, it just keeps everyone sleeping well at night and keep, keeps the project clean. Uh, if there is a timeline hiccup, the land bank can be flexible if they see you're making progress in the renovation. Communication is obviously key for both sides. So you get to work. Uh, pull your permits. Turn on your utilities, order your meters, start the work. If you're using contractors, be sure to have clear written contracts, including timelines with reputable businesses. That's not so much an issue for us because we do a lot of our construction in-house, uh, but is definitely something to always watch for as, as you're engaging in, in this type of work. Uh, be ready for your milestone inspections. As Dennis stated, I think they're as important so that I can make my uh, construction managers accountable as it is to to keep the, the developers accountable. Um, once your work is complete, 
Uh, you get the final inspection and you're ready for a formal closing. Uh, after closing, some utilities may still need to be transitioned to the name of the purchaser. Thank you very much for your time. I'll be available for questions later. Thank you so much for that um, important insight, Amanda, from the private sector side. Now we will go to the nonprofit side uh, and Tiffany from YNDC. Great, right, thanks Isaac. So um, I will say that even on the nonprofit side, a lot of our process is very similar to Amanda's in the actual rehab of the building. So I won't rehash that, but just talk a little bit about what we do in Youngstown um, with the Mahoning County Land Bank. Um, certainly I am with the Youngstown Neighborhood Development Corporation. I'm the housing director here and we are not a land bank, but we have a very strong partnership with the Mahoning County Land Bank um, that's a little different than um, some of the other CDC land bank partnerships that you see in other communities, but especially if you are a smaller land bank in a smaller community, um, this is a model that I think is, is replicable and, and something that, that certainly should be considered. Um, I think that, that we're kind of the, the answer to an alternative. Um, you know, Dennis spoke about having CDC partnerships and how uh, it's often not profitable. Um, but I think we've really figured out how to make that work in our community. So that's something I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and so as I said, YNC is not a land bank, but we do partner with the Mahoning County Land Bank. Um, the benefit of this is that we each get to share our own expertise and really work in um, our wheelhouse as, as far as what we each do. And so certainly as a CDC, we can't do what the land bank does. Um, but we do have a lot of expertise in um, community organizing and then uh, rehabilitation of buildings as well. And so our partnership is unique in that um, when we are acquiring a property from the land bank, uh, we will pay the land bank their court cost of foreclosing on the property, which on average is about $550 at front. So we acquire the properties for $550 each, and then we rehabilitate the properties, which I'll go through a little bit through that process in a minute. Um, once we've rehabbed the properties and then sold them to a new homeowner, uh, we split the profit with the land bank. And so anything above our hard and soft costs, we split evenly. So we get to keep a little bit and the land bank also profits as well from, from the deal. So um, it's not deed and escrow. Uh, it's just a little bit of a different partnership, standing partnership and agreement that we have with the Mahoney County Land Bank that's unique to our organization. It's not something they do with other organizations in our county. Um, I'll say this, because uh, I know new construction is kind of like the hip, exciting thing that everyone's wanting to do these days. We do new construction now. I can't believe we're already doing new construction. I didn't expect that we would when I started this work, but um, we're only 10 years old, but we definitely didn't start there. So today I'm gonna kind of go through some of the process of, of where we started and, and how we got there. And so um, I'm gonna flip through too, just so you guys know, I'm not really using like slides that I'm gonna read off of, but it does show pictures of some of our work with the land bank and, and some of the rehabs we've been able to do alongside of them. And so you'll just see some before and after pictures as I go through today. So right now um, we have rehabilitated and, and redeveloped almost 150 units between housing for rent, resale, and commercial properties as an organization. But when we started 10 years ago, we were only rehabilitating two to three properties a year using a lot of subsidies. So, you know, we would put $150,000, well, maybe not $150,000, maybe $100,000 into rehabbing a house using a general contractor that then we'd only be able to sell for about $30,000. Um, today, we've developed our process to a point where often we are profit profiting on these properties and we're able to reinvest that profit into the work we're doing in the community. And so how we've been able to do that is certainly um, couldn't be done without the help of our land bank because they really cut down on our acquisition and give us the freedom um, and the cash flow to be able to work through these, these properties um, and then sell them and, and profit on the end and, and pay for them at the end of the process as well. And so the way we've been able to become profitable is the vertical integration of our housing development processes. And so um, we are planners. Uh, we do a lot of planning for the city of Youngstown and certainly use our plans to inform 
the land bank. So uh, the land bank comes to us often for uh, determining, you know, what properties they need to acquire, whether it's for us to rehab or for them to do a deed in escrow um, or for their demolition. And so, uh, so we do planning for um, our community and, and share that with our partners. Throughout the process, we own the properties. Like I said, um, it's not a deed and escrow situation. Uh, the, the land bank does sign those over to us um, at the, the front end of the process. Uh, we develop and manage the entire um, construction process and act as our own general contractor. Um, over the years, we've developed our own in-house construction team. We have our own licensed electrician on staff. Um, we have a plumber, carpenter, a painter, um, a guy that does flooring and tile. Um, and so most of the work we're doing ourselves with the exception of roofs and HVAC systems, we're pretty much doing everything in-house. And we're usually not do, using subsidy and, and there are some benefits to this. So, so these days um, we're primarily using private funds, our own funding, um, but we do limit who can purchase the home. So um, the benefits of not using subsidy is that, that you can open up the market of buyers that are available to you. Um, one thing that we're very concerned about in Youngstown is making sure that we're not concentrating poverty. And if we're using a ton of subsidy that limits the buyers only to very low income individuals, um, then we're, we're furthering uh, some of the struggles that we have in our communities. And we really want to encourage um, people at all economic levels to, to come in. Now keep in mind that the housing market in Youngstown is such that all of our housing is very affordable. Even once we fully rehabilitated a property, I'll, I'll tell you the, the most expensive single family home we ever sold. I think we sold for $125,000 and it was like a 3,500 square foot mansion overlooking a lake. So, um, and it was fully rehab with all new mechanicals and everything. Um, so our housing market is very affordable um, and our average sale price of a home at this point is about $70,000 fully rehabbed. Um, but we do restrict the home buyers to owner occupants only, um, but without any income restrictions. Now on to uh, the new construction, which I know is what everyone wants to talk about. Um, as I'm flipping through these pictures, this is a commercial building we just acquired and, and rehabilitated uh, alongside with the land bank. Um, but here's the new construction. So um, one thing I'll say about new construction is you can't do it in a vacuum. You can't just pick a property and say, we're gonna build a new house on this and it's gonna be great and everyone's gonna to wanna to buy it. That's not realistic. You can't do it in a vacuum. So um, the properties that we're looking at, um, this is the first one, 4212 Helena. We built three new construction homes last year on um, vacant lots uh, on one street, actually a, a one block street. So keep in mind a very short street that we've been working on for six plus years alongside the land bank. So actually the, the properties that we redeveloped were lots that uh, became vacant after the land bank demolished the homes that were on them. Um, in addition to those demolitions, the land bank did several other demolitions. Uh, we rehabilitated three vacant houses and then sold it on the street. We acquired a, a troublesome um, three unit apartment building uh, that had a lot of criminal activity. We also rehabilitated that and then rented it out and we maintained ownership of that. Um, we did two additional lot stabilization projects. We had a few contractors that we work with that actually invested in other homes on the street. We did multiple repairs and rehabilitations for owner occupants who were low income on that street and did street tree planning among uh, many other things that we did there before we were able to do that new home construction. Um, it was highly subsidized using the Federal Home Loan Bank of Pittsburgh funding. Um, the homes cost us each about $270,000 to build, and then we were able to sell them for $95,000. And so again, um, this process uh, takes time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of partners, um, certainly the land bank, but uh, also the communities where we're working and all the neighbors were involved in this project. And, um, and, and it takes a lot of time and, and a lot of um, incremental effort to, to get these things done. And so, um, 
So if you're just starting out, please don't think you're going to pick a vacant lot and build a new house on it. Um, there is a lot, there is a lot more that, that comes before that step, but it's certainly a, a goal that we can strive for and, and certain, certainly something our organization hopes to continue doing in the future among our other efforts um, as we work to revitalize our community. And that's all I have. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, Tiffany. Really impressive work you guys are doing down there. And last but certainly not least, we have Carrie um, to talk about the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act Initiative. And Carrie, reviewing your, your bio, I'm really bummed we're not having a happy hour after this session. I want to hear more about your urban homesteading in New York City in the 80s. I'm sure that was totally nuts. It seems like you've worked uh, around housing issues anywhere and everywhere in the US. So um, I know we're focusing today, but maybe another time. Um, I'm sorry we're not going to a happy hour also, but um, being that we can't see each other, everyone should feel free to pour themselves a drink at this point. Um, so I'm Carrie Shea, and I am the founder and organizer of the Neighborhood Homes Investment Coalition. Um, can you advance the slide? 70% of all Americans currently live in single family homes and 80% of all Americans would like to. Um, whether we like it or not, we really are a nation of single family homes. This holds true for both homeowners as well as renters. Most renters in America are living in a single family home. Next slide. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily a home um, in a suburban tract somewhere. Um, a lot of single family housing and one to four family housing is actually in dense or relatively dense um, urban places. Next slide. Um, and in these places, and Isaac gave um, a lot of great statistics at the beginning of his uh, introduction about some of the challenges in Ohio, particularly around the aging housing stock. Um, the other big challenge in Ohio, and um, Tiffany's numbers are somewhat shocking um, to someone from the Northeast like I am, um, the property values are really very modest. Next slide. So in um, many of the urban and older inner ring suburbs and even rural places um, in Ohio, um, you're faced with an aging housing stock, much of it in need of repair, um, a shortage of move and ready starter homes for renters who are looking to become homeowners, um, where you haven't had a lot of market activity Quite often you find that there's a lack of appraisals um, in, in these areas. Um, and um, like a lot of other places in um, the cold Northeast, the, uh, the Midwest, um, you are faced with a lot of, or challenged by a lot of abandoned properties um, that, are, that are also in need of uh, substantial renovation. Next slide. Um, the, the problems that are created by these conditions um, are, are, are many, but one of the toughest ones that developers have to overcome is essentially the value gap problem. Um, other people might refer this, or you might hear it referred to as the appraisal gap problem, but basically it's a situation where the post-construction value of a property is greater um, is, I'm sorry, is less than what it costs to acquire it and rehab it. So um, just quickly walking through these numbers, if you have a deteriorated home that you can pick up for $40,000 and $150,000 remodeling expense, your total project cost on that is $190,000. Post-construction value of that home may only be $140,000 and therefore, a developer is looking at a gap of $50,000. Um, and the project cannot go forward unless this gap is filled. Next slide. 
Um, this holds true also for new construction projects. Um, you might be able to pick up a lot for $15,000, but the construction costs on that lot may be $195,000, leaving you a total development cost of 210. Post-construction value may only be $150,000. And again, you're facing an appraisal or value gap that has to be filled in order for the project to go forward. Next slide. Um, I live in Hartford, Connecticut now. Um, this is where I'm from and I returned here after 40 years away. Um, and Hartford um, not only is the insurance capital of the world and home to Mark Twain, but is one of the poorest cities of its size in America. Um, and uh, one in every 10 houses in the city of Hartford is actually um, vacant. Um, despite the incredible need, and despite the fact that our uh, housing stock is largely one to four family housing, um, we're in a real bind because very little of the federal money that comes to the city of Hartford can actually be used for the repair or um, total renovation of um, single family homes. We rely, as I'm sure many of you do, um, on our home allocation. Um, but the home allocation is very small. And just for the city of Hartford, and I'll walk through this quickly, um, we only get $1.3 million a year from home. If you take a purchase price and renovation cost, total development cost, 290, sale price of 240, you have an appraisal gap on each property of $50,000. Um, because the home money only serves people earning up to 80% of AMI, the home buyer is probably also going to need um, some assistance. And so your total subsidy need per house in the city of Hartford is probably going to be about $65,000. Um, if every single dollar of home is given to single family home developers for the revitalization of single family homes in Hartford, we can only do 20 a year. And quite honestly, we lose more than 20 houses a year through deterioration and, and simply houses that fall down after a bad storm. Next slide. So what is needed? We as developers working in these distressed cities where the um, primary housing typology is one to four family houses need a reliable source of subsidy to fill the gap between what it costs us to rehab or build a home and what it can be sold for. Next slide. Um, so about four or five years ago, a bunch of national organizations came together down in New Orleans and we get, began talking about this problem. Over time, we've grown into what we now call the Neighborhood Homes uh, Coalition. Next slide. Um, and we are proposing a piece of legislation called the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act. Um, this would be a new, create a new federal tax credit to attract capital to di distressed neighborhoods for the new construction and or substantial rehabilitation of one to four family housing. Next slide. Um, the way it would work is um, states would be given a tax credit allocation of $6 per capita. The states would write allocation plans and developers would compete um, for this, these tax credits. We refer to the developers or um, as uh, Neighborhood Homes Investment Act managers, it could be developers, investors, lenders, CDFIs, but these entities would compete for these allocations. And then when awarded would use these allocations to raise equity capital from investors solely to cover the appraisal gap on their projects. Um, these managers would rehab or build the homes and then sell them to eligible buyers. Next slide. Um, in order, the money can only be used in eligible census tracts and in order for a census tract to become eligible, it must meet these three criteria. 
um, a high poverty rate, a median family income of less than 80% of median family income, and then a low, uh, a median house value less than 100% of the area median house value. Next slide. Um, these are the types of homes that would be eligible for this money. Next slide. Um, in order to not um, fuel gentrification or markets that are already hot, there are a number of guardrails. Um, one of them is that the maximum home price of a house in this program um, post-construction cannot exceed four times the state MFI. So for homes done in Ohio with this money, um, the sale price at the end of the project can't be more than 224,444. Next slide. Um, what's sort of unique about this program is that the um, home buyers um, can have household incomes that are up to 140% of the area median income. However, um, if states would like, they could actually um, modify this, um, but this is what they are allowed to go up to. Next slide. Um, the financing covers 35% of the total eligible development costs, and there's a $25,000 minimum rehab per unit. Next slide. Um, why don't we, because time is up, why don't we skip through these slides um, and I'm happy to, you know, answer questions. Um, the This is just, um, and, and I'm sure that uh, these presentations will be accessible through the um, conference, but um, this is pretty much how one of these deals look. Um, and, you know, you all can fool around with the numbers on your own projects. Next slide. Um, when the project is completed, um, the tax credit holder can actually claim the tax credits, but the house must be completed, inspected, and occupied by an eligible owner. Um, there is no recapture, however, for the investor. However, if the home sells within five years, the homeowner must pay 50% of the property appreciation um, to the state for reuse in a future neighborhood revitalization project. Next slide. These are some of the outcomes that we hope to achieve. And next slide. Um, so where we are with this, we have a bill in the House um, and one in the Senate. The one in the Senate is actually co-sponsored by Senator Portman. Um, we are now working in Ohio to bring um, Representatives Beattie, Wenstrup, Gonzalez, and Chabot on as um, co-sponsors of the House bill, which is H.R. 3316. Um, I really encourage you to reach out to us if you would like your organization to be added to a sign-on letter that we're currently circulating through Ohio. Um, there seems to be a lot of interest in this, and I think if there's a show of support from the development community and the land bank communities, um, we will see uh, these representatives sign on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carrie, and I appreciate you ending on that note on how the Land Bank Association and others on this conference can really take an actionable approach on this rehab. I think the Land Bank Network has obviously gotten a lot of credit for its work on vacant and distressed properties, but maybe doesn't get as much recognition on the rehab front, even though, as Dennis and others have mentioned, that is sort of a, a priority when, when the numbers can work. So going into the q and A. I do have one question, Tiffany, if you could, um, you did sort of talk about that value gap that you're dealing with, but I'm wondering how you're able to make, I think you threw out some pretty wide shifts in numbers of putting 150 or 100 yeah. in, only getting, how were you able to deal with that gap initially? Sure, so I, I think there were two key pieces there. So first is that 
um, you know, we had to change our process internally. So when we first started, as many people do, we were using home funds and we were using a general contractor to do all the work. And so really integrating that process internally to where we were hiring our own construction team and doing a lot of that work ourselves saved us a lot on the overhead as far as the amount of money we were putting into the properties. And then on the, the, the back end of selling it, you know, um, YNDC doesn't just acquire and rehab vacant properties, although that's what people like to hear about. So that's what we're always talking about, right? Um, and so we do a lot of planning. We do a lot of community organizing. Um, we do a lot of repair and rehabilitation of owner-occupied properties for low-income homeowners. Um, and it is real key for us when we sell the properties, uh, we do use realtors so that we make sure that the, the value um, is in the MLS so that when it when future homes get appraised, those comps are available. And so, um, yeah, it's been really incremental. And, and I can't say that that's all us, right? Because there has been just a, a general inflation in, in values in homes across the United States and over the past 10 years. And so, so I can't say it's all us. So, so a lot of that, it just has to do with inflation, but, but quite a bit of it, especially in, in some of the key neighborhoods where we're working is just, um, you know, a uh, strategic and comprehensive effort to improve the community, even outside of our rehabilitation of vacant homes. Thank you. And Carrie, we got a question from Millie in the chat for you, um, asking about the terms of affordability with the with this legislation, and will they utilize a restrictive covenant? And if you are working with the Ohio Housing Council. You could answer those. Um, no to the last question, um, but I'd love to be uh, put in touch with them. Um, okay. And so this is not an affordable housing program. This is really a neighborhood revitalization program. And as um, Tiffany alluded to in her presentation, um, you, you know, we are looking to make um, to open our neighborhoods and keep them open, um, particularly for people who are renters in the neighborhoods and now looking to buy. Um, what many of us who did a lot of single family housing and for, uh, for sale housing work find out pretty quickly is it is very difficult to, um, to sell houses that, are, um, that have tight income restrictions on them. Um, it's very hard for people to qualify for a mortgage, um, particularly low-income people, particularly low-income people with debt. Um, and so, you know, part of this is pragmatic and part of it is um, based on ideology. I think there's a lot, the thinking was that we want the neighbors, the, the neighborhoods to have income diversity, um, and be as open as possible. These houses are not being sold um, at a subsidized rate. The homeowner is not getting a subsidy. The subsidy goes to the developer. The home buyer is paying full market value for these houses. Um, so that was one reason, but the other was just the very practical. When, when um, I was developing homes down in New Orleans with a nonprofit and we were starting a new home every two weeks, um, that meant we had to come up with a new buyer every two weeks. And um, the very people who we talked about serving, the firefighters and first respond teachers and so on and so forth, they made too much money to qualify for our homes. Um, so we really had to get those two things um, kind of worked out. And what we realized was there's a lot of need um, and it's not necessarily based on a particular number or point within um, the, the income range. So um, we saw that NSP went up to 120. We thought we could even be more successful with 140. Great. Can I chime in here too, just off of mm -hmm. what, what Carrie had to say? You know, one of the reasons that we decided to change our model and, and to, to create our own in-house construction team and, and to 
kind of find a way to do this work without subsidy um, was because of that very thing. So we had these beautiful properties for sale that we had used home or NSP to fund. And we had a lot of people who, who had good income, who were qualified to purchase homes, who wanted to buy houses in neighborhoods that the thought process was that no one wanted, you know, people thought no one wanted to live here, but we had tons of people who wanted to buy the homes and they couldn't because of that income restriction. And the, the, the issue we found in our community was not necessarily that people don't want to invest in the community. It's that there's, they didn't have anything to invest in. So the quality of our housing was so low and, and still is so low. Um, you know, our housing stock is much older. It's deteriorating. It hasn't been updated in years. And when we finally did, create a few house, quality housing units, they were so income restricted that we struggled to find buyers, but there was a huge market of buyers who really wanted to purchase these properties, but just weren't able to. And so we had to find a way to bring people who really wanted to invest in our city and in our neighborhoods into those communities. Perfect, thank you. And Amanda, I guess a question for you, not that you have to you know, share all your secrets with the group, but how have you been able to do this from a private side? Um, I, just because I think you've sort of, similar to doing the construction in-house, things like that. But if you could talk about how you've been able to make these projects work, because a lot of times people say, oh, we can't make money in some of these neighborhoods or they'll just buy them for rentals and not put any money into them. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Well, I would say that that is a, a work in progress. And what I mean by that is, we, uh, this is not the primary focus of our business. Mm -hmm. This was something we did to, to give back to the community. And so we're now at the point where we've got uh, multiple renovated houses or houses just ready to come on the market. And we are working with our uh, local CDCs and our the Mayor's Neighborhood Transformation Initiative in Cleveland and other local resources to attract the right buyers and to make sure that it is affordable uh, perhaps with city down payment assistance. Um, so that, that's something I'd say we're, we're still working on. The, the, the challenge that we see, like Carrie stated, is going to be an appraisal gap. And we're talking about houses that are selling in these neighborhoods for between 60 and $100,000. Uh, but the comps are $20,000, $30,000. So, so it's a little challenging. We've really focused on, on doubles, duplexes, mm -hmm. because we feel like um, they cash flow in a way that really makes sense for an owner occupant. And, and that if we can get banks to look at them a little bit differently, then, then they'll have a, a solid tenant with a, a safety net as the secondary um, resident. And uh, there are some exciting new, new banking opportunities in Cleveland that are rolling out specifically targeting uh, lower, um, lower dollar value mortgages. So we're, we're uh, working those angles. We have not yet sold our first home, but, but we are, are ready to, and we think the pricing is right. Uh, we just have to get through the appraisal process. Okay, thank you for that detail. And then, you know, I don't think it would be fair to, to sort of finish the session without talking about COVID since we all are all virtual right now because of it. And Sally Martin brought this up a little bit with the state forfeiture, state forfeiture lands inventory, but this is maybe a question for Dennis a little bit. Also, Tiffany or anyone can weigh in is sort of the responsibility of land banks or community development corporations to step in on occupied properties as COVID um, continues to rear its head on potential mortgage foreclosures or tax delinquencies moving it forward in the next year or two, what can be done or what should be done to help um, so we don't create a second wave of a foreclosure crisis like we saw in 2008? Well, um, can you hear me? I mean, the way we, uh, we don't have a specific uh, COVID response, if you will. What we have done historically is that we periodically and regularly review the properties on the forfeiture list. Um, and we determine based upon the condition of the property, neighborhood, et cetera, what's the best course. In many cases, the best course really is a, is a demolition because if it got to the state forfeiture list, that means it's already, in most cases, been exposed to tax foreclosure, 
at least two or three sales, it's down the road a bit. And demolition really is, is the best option. There are occasions, however, where we have taken a property um, with an occupant, but our focus in those cases is to make sure that we, we really have a viable plan for the occupant, whether it's um, to provide them a lease, um, you know, or to offload the property to a community partner that's better equipped to deal with the occupant and perhaps the occupant's issue. And we do that occasionally um, and strategically. It's not something that, you know, because it's, it's very tricky um, for, for a whole host of reasons, but it's something, it's a tool that we use um, um, on, on an occasional basis when we find that it's necessary. I, I would chime in here and say that, that when we're looking at, at properties to, to acquire from CCLRC, um, never in our experience has there ever been a situation where there is an occupant because by the time the properties are, have either caught our attention or are on the CCLRC lists, like Dennis said, they're they are really down the road and distressed in such a way that, that uh, tenancy is not viable. Um, so I don't believe that, that our intention as private developers or CCLRC's intention as, as a land bank is to, you know, take a home from, from a little old lady that couldn't make her tax payment and, and turn that over to someone else. It's really, you know, distressed properties. And obviously I can't speak to um, the fact that these properties end up in forfeiture, um, but, you know, we're not looking at occupied properties as part of our business model. I assume that the, the question is, is focused primarily on um, occupied properties that perhaps were forfeited by an owner that, that a tenant is still in. And we have run into that situation um, a, a few times, not so much with properties coming from our land bank. Um, I can't say that's never happened, but um, you know, that's not the, the focus of our land bank or I, I think really any of them. Um, but there have been multiple times where we've uh, acquired a property uh, through a bank foreclosure or, or something like that, or a bank has even foreclosed on a, a house not realizing that the tent was in it and then come to us and said, oh boy, what do we do now? Um, and so I think this is another place where having a, a CDC partner can be of real value, especially if you have an experienced CDC partner um, wherever you're located. Um, you know, one thing about YNDC that, that has been helpful to, to our partners who have encountered the situation is that in addition to the rehab experience, we have quite a bit of experience with owner occupants. We're also landlords ourselves. We have about 37 rental properties that we manage, um, own and manage. And then uh, additionally, we have some community lending experience. So there have been um, cases where we've been able to uh, take ownership of the property, fix it up and maintain um, the tenant in the property. Um, there have been cases where we've been able to acquire the property mm -hmm. and actually get the a tenant into a mortgage where they were then able to purchase the house. Um, and those have been, you know, we've had, a, a, again, not something that's part of our business model or that we hope to do, but occasionally our partners get into a situation where they're like, you know, we don't, we don't want to put this person out on the street. What do we do? And we've been able to help assist them um, in, in keeping the, the tenants in the house. And in some cases, even moving them towards ownership, which is ultimately our goal in many cases anyway. Great. Thank you everyone for those answers. And in the interest of time, I'd like to thank all of our panelists today for a great conversation and sharing all of your years of expertise. We're going to take a brief break and we'll be back for the final session of the 10th Annual Ohio Land Bank Conference at 350. Thank you everyone.